Hey everybody, this is Alexander Fitzgerald or Assassinato, and today we're going to be discussing adjusting from online tournaments to cash games. We will also be discussing some of the differences between online tournaments and cash games. Let's get to work. Adjusting from online tournaments to cash games. Are you looking to transition from online tournaments to cash games? You've come to the right place. Let's discuss some quick fixes that can help you transition effectively today. Now, this is going to be a fun one to, to do, guys, because uh, I've been lucky enough to have had some success in both fields. I, I play a lot lower stakes, though, generally than a lot of people. So uh, not to get too much into my credentials, but I, I do have WCOOP and SCOOP wins. I, I, w, I do have WPT and EBT final tables. My most recent win was the 250K guaranteed, but I play mostly low to mid stakes tournaments. So I know the problems a lot of you are actually facing. I also play a lot of low stakes cash. I just like to multi-table and really grind it out like that. So there are really key differences though, between the two formats that you don't hear people discuss enough as maybe should be discussed because it really, they're, they're very different games. And when I play those two different games, they, it's almost, you have to become a different player in each of them. So we'll discuss those today. I'll, I'll give you what's worked for me over the years. So here's the big thing in cash games. This took me a really long time to learn, but you have time in poker tournaments. Players are rewarded for firing their chips in constantly. The blind in Annie structure is severe. Picking up orphan pots is immensely important. In this environment, attacking and sometimes slightly reckless poker is rewarded. For these reasons, many tournament players get used to playing loose and aggressive constantly. So let me give you an example of that. So a lot of times my friends say, oh, I, oh, I want to watch you play cash game poker. I bet that'll be really fun just because this is my job. And I, I always tell them like, dude, it's not when you watch me play cash game poker it's not super fun to watch because i i just i get called quite a bit more often than perhaps i should be called i i guess i just look like the typical person that is running too many bluffs at the table so a lot of the times when i'm playing cash i can just sit on my leather ass all day and chill there and actually get paid off on my big hands it, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be that elaborate and that's really different than poker tournaments where obviously you have to really pick up the pace when the blinds and annies are being raised quite a bit so when when you do play tournaments a lot of the times if nobody's three betting you and you could get that big blind player to call you and that big blind player is just going to call you with half the deck and hit lots of really crappy pairs and pay you off way too much. You really want to think about opening hands that you would normally never open in a cash game. Similarly, if someone is just opening way too many hands in a tournament and it's just calling every single time when you three bet them and they just have tons of garbage hands out of position in those big pots, you really want to be attacking. Now that's going to make you a very active player in tournaments but that doesn't matter as much because the tables are breaking so fast you, you're the blind levels are moving up so often people are busting so often that everybody's got to get moving at some point so if you're attacking it's not going to affect you nearly as much now a lot of cash game poker uh in my experience is convincing people that you're bluffing way more often than you actually are and actually taking advantage of the fact that the blinds and annies don't go up that often. I mean, don't go up at all unless you decide to go to another table. You know what I meant. Anyway, continuing, you have time. In cash games, there's less money in the middle of every pot, so there's less incentive to steal with weak hands. In this environment, you can play more solid hands in position to make more money. You have time to wait for big pots in position. So I do this experiment. You should always do experiments when you're playing because the great thing about experiments is they're allowed to fail. So don't be afraid to try an experiment every once in a while when you're playing just to see what happens. So sometimes when I'm on a bad run in early position in cash games, I'll just start opening eights plus ace queen offsuit, which is way too tight for the long term but i'll do that whenever i'm feeling like i'm getting out of line a little bit from early position i've just gotten in the habit of opening too much 
And it's embarrassing how often that works, just opening tighter. So, it, and obviously you expand it beyond that once you get a little bit more comfortable uh, playing a little bit tighter again and not just going for it every single time you have uh, a 10, seven suited and whatever you were opening too much was just causing you so many problems. But yeah, you in cash games, you can definitely be more solid because you do have the time. Now in tournaments, there's a lot of times. The other thing about tournaments is let's say you're a little reckless at the beginning, just a touch reckless. That's not necessarily a bad thing because let's say you build your stack. It's in a lot of tournaments, nobody can reload in any fashion. So deeper in the tournament, when you have 70 big blinds and everybody else has 30 or 40 big blinds, well, every one of your check raises, every one of your double barrels, every one of your three bets is going to risk all of their chips and very much make many of these people fold. Whereas if you go from 70 big blinds to 58 big blinds, that, that sucks, but it's not going to meaningfully change your chances of winning the tournament in as substantial a way as for them going from 30 big blinds to 18 or whatever it is, right? Because they lose so much more ability to maneuver, ability to do anything when they go from a short stack to a shorter stack. If they lose the ability to three bet, they lose the ability to even open sometimes. If they just have to shove or fold, that can be detrimental to playing the tournament in the fashion that you want to play. So being a little bit reckless in tournaments, I'm not convinced is the worst idea in the world because it does get you in those it does get you in those stack size dynamics where you can really take advantage of people. Whereas in cash games, okay, sometimes there's value in advertising. You're a little bit wilder, but everybody can just reload. So it's not like you're going to have a stack size disparity that you can take advantage of. Start tight, then adjust. In tournaments, you have to start attacking quickly. That That's something at the beginning of tournaments, you're going to get a lot of players that are there casually. There, this is a big day for them. They're recreational and they're just going to be limp calling quite a bit. So you really want to make sure you're paying attention and getting involved in pots with them. In tournaments, you have to start attacking quickly. Blinds and annies escalate. And you never get a great, great read on your opponents because a lot of the, the times they're at a new table or they boss by the time you start getting a read. You don't get many hands with them. In cash game poker, though, you might play with some of your opponents every single day. You have time to develop nuanced reads versus them. Start tight, then adjust. While you're gathering intel, don't give off information yourself. People have a hard time shaking first impressions. If you play tighter poker when you first get into the game, people will label you as a nit. You can exploit that image later. If you're playing on a site that allows statistic tracking, then this is another edge you can exploit. Play solid poker and collect information on your opponents. When you're not playing, pull up the statistics you gathered on your opponents and start drawing up a playbook to beat them. This was uh, when I was really in love with poker and just playing like 60, 80 hours a week, just massively multi-tabling and just grinding so many hours. This is what I really lived for, was just trying to figure out, okay, these five people are at every single one of my tables. How do I beat them? And just drawing up game plans, it really felt like getting to be a head coach in uh, the NFL. It, it really was fun just coming up with plans to try and beat these people. Like, do, does this person fold a little too much on the river? Does this person check raise too much from this position? What could we actually use in each of these situations? What does this person always triple barrel on a certain board? Just like pulling up the hands in the situations and really trying uh, to go around it. And you don't have to start as complicated as I just made it. It can be as much as, it can be as simple as just pulling up every similar situation you played with one player. Like, okay, what do they do in every single pot where they three bet you? What were those hands, if anything, got to show down? What did they do on the flop? What did they do on the turn? What did they do on the river? You You will be amazed what you discover in someone's game if you actually pay granular attention to them like that. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. In tournament poker, you are playing against gambling recreational players. They are comfortable with allowing you to take the lead. Many of them will not take the initiative in a pot. They will allow you to dictate terms. This will help you. This will help make your poker playing simple. 
in cash games, players are comfortable playing with larger stacks. They're willing to put you to the test more often. You will need to do homework away from the table to get comfortable in these deep stack situations. It can be a profitable play, for example, to three bet button openers from the blinds. However, this situation will also see you playing out of position frequently. So you do want to make sure if you're using a poker training site, doing all the quizzes, you can, you know, taking a bunch of notes, really drilling things. You want to make sure you study before the exam. Whereas uh, in tournament poker, you do have to study quite a bit too. But a lot of the times you can, uh, you're not going to be as deep stacked. So you're not going to be playing really complicated turns and rivers as much. So you do want to focus a little bit more on the shorter stack situations in tournaments. I do find a lot of people have gaps in that. That's something I struggle with myself. I'm always just a touch too tight whenever I run the numbers than I should be. But if you're going to play cash games, you will be playing very difficult turns in river. So you want to do as much work before you get to the table as possible on that. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Study the game before you get to the table. Play lower stakes than you normally would play. Play hard. Collect information from your sessions. Assess what you've learned and apply yourself again the next day. Once you are comfortable with situations that make other players uncomfortable, you will have more tools in your toolbox. This will allow you to exploit the tables more effectively. You can make good money raising with weak hands when players to your left are not three betting or flatting enough. Your most frequent situation when you engage in this loose play is heads up pots with the big blind. This is a great situation because your opponent is playing a raise pot out of position with a capped range. It's hard to win when you're in that disadvantageous of a situation. However, when you engage in this strategy, you will sometimes run into players who three bet or cold call you when they're in position. This makes your life difficult when you started with a weak hand. If you can drill this situation and neutralize your positional disadvantage, you will have a good reason to open up your game at softer tables. If you don't practice out of position deep stack scenarios, then you will be forced to play the majority of your larger pots from the button and cutoff. This will work at lower stakes, but it will become an impediment moving up. So we covered a lot there. So in tournaments, a lot of people just aren't going to play back at you as much as they should because there's more recreational players. Uh, assuming you're game selecting with any degree, to, uh, with any degree of proficiency. If you're game selecting at all, people just, there's a lot of things people should be doing in tournament poker. They're just not doing in tournament poker. Or if you're playing lower stakes, there's just a lot of people playing for fun. So you can set up that really nice situation again and again, where you're opening and getting the big blind to call you in tournaments. And that is just an excellent situation to set up because your opponent is playing way too many hands out of position in a raised pot. And more of your continuation bets are going to work because they're going to miss so often. And when they do hit, they mit, they do hit very jagged pairs. So you can get a lot of value from them if you flopped a pretty decent second pair or top pair. Now that's a situation you can exploit as well in cash games, but cash game players have more tools. They have deeper stacks in which to apply pressure on you. Also, they have more time to observe you just because you end up playing longer sessions with the same people. So you do want to be careful as you add that play to your repertoire in cash games. So you want to make sure, okay, these are truly recreational players. They're not paying attention to me. Okay, now I'll open a little bit more. If you think the players to your left actually are playing pretty seriously, and there are people that take any buy-in cash game seriously, you always have time in cash games to revert back to just solid poker. Whereas sometimes uh, due to tournaments, just the blind levels going up so often, you will have to make a move at some point. Table selection will make or break you. 90% of your job in poker is table selection. It doesn't matter if you're the 10th best player in the world. If you're sitting at a table with the nine best players in the world, then you're going to lose. Conversely, if you constantly surround yourself with weaker players who are not as assertive, then you are far more likely to win. It is unlikely you'll ever find a table completely without solid players. You will have to get comfortable being un uncomfortable in pots with them. But once you are outside of pots with them, you will have to work to clean out a recreational player's money as quickly as possible. 
collect information on the players you're playing against. If there is an obvious wet whale, then you should seek to be at every single table they play, and you should try to get into as many pots as possible with them. If there are obvious killers at your level, then seek to avoid their tables if at all possible, which is going to be difficult. But if the one thing you can do is try to get position on them, try to make pots with them as small as possible, try to generally stay out of their way, it work like that. When you're playing tournaments, if you're playing a low enough buy-in tournament or if you're playing on a big enough site that attracts a number of recreational players, if there's enough players in the field, you're it's going to be soft enough. If there's 500 runners in a $50 tournament, you're fine. There, there's just going to be a lot of people going, ah, 50 bucks, it's a Friday night, let's have fun. Or it, it's Sunday, I'm having a good time, let's go ahead and play, right? So that is table selection is more or less built in if you're playing low to mid stakes tournaments. Now, obviously, as you move up in stakes in tournaments, you're going to have to really pay attention to, okay, who's buying into this? What was the promotion like for this tournament? Were there a number of satellite winners, et cetera? Or is this just all killers? Now, when you're playing cash games, you can completely change how much money you make in a session based on your table selection. It's a, uh, it's amazing to me when you play live, how few, how many people just won't move from a table they know is bad. And I don't know if it's just a loss of face. They just don't want to admit, I don't want to play with these players. But uh, if you can locate loose, passive tables in cash games, that that is 90% of your job. And the, the way you'll identify it is just with the classic signs. People limping quite a bit, people limb calling quite a bit, uh, people calling out of position quite often, people calling down often with really weak hands, people raising with really goofy hands and constantly calling three bats out of position. That kind of stuff will really set you up for good situations. These players can turn hands into bluffs. This is one of the biggest differences you will see between the two formats. This is a major point that tournament players miss constantly when they move to cash. Tournament players are used to playing shorter stacks. When you're playing with shorter stacks, you can go to the felt with a variety of your top pairs and even second pairs. Defending yourself with your best pairs on a short stack is not a bad strategy. Because tournament players get used to this, they generally don't fold their decent pairs when they're playing with larger stacks. They don't want to fold them, but they don't want to rip their chips in with them either. They end up calling down with most of their pairs and allowing their opponents to dictate terms. Since your opponent are in, I mean, this is just something, uh, this is a general thing that should be discussed. You will see a lot of guys in who are used to tournament poker are used to 30, 40 big blinds. Maybe they play mega height at the beginning and then it gets to 30 to 40 big blind poker or they're just massively multi-tabling and they start really paying attention when they're deep and it's like 50 big blinds or something like that. A lot of times when those players are playing cash, they they do tend to call down quite a bit with top pairs and second pairs and maybe one of the, there's a lot of times you have a second pair that you should just turn into a bluff, but you won't see that happen as often as it should be done. If you're just used to calling down with your 27 X stack and your weak pair in whatever it is. So anyway, since your opponents are not used to playing deep stacks in a creative ma manner, you can value bet thinly in many tournaments. Your opponents will see their decision as binary. Do I call or fold here? So there's uh, one of the most, this is something I see. I, I, I taught a lot of different students in private lessons. This is something I see with tournament players quite often, which is they just don't consider turning their hands into bluffs nearly as much, just because that situation doesn't come up as much when they're playing because they're playing with shorter stacks a lot of the time. And you're just not going to get into as many elaborate turn or river situations. So the way you get practice for that in cash games is a lot of times you, you check river and the guy fires and you know, he would have double barreled a flusher or something just from playing with him earlier. And now he's betting when the flush rock came in and it's okay, whatever, you know, this is, a loose hypothetical, but maybe now I should turn my second pair into a bluff or whatever it is. That situation doesn't come up as much in tournaments. If, if you guys are just all in on the turn or whatever it is, right? Or if you just re-raised, if the stacks are just shorter 
and you just didn't even get to a more elaborate river to begin with, or if your shove isn't going to be that many chips, so you're not even sure if this bluff is really going to work. So for that reason, you'll see a lot of people, your opponents not being used to playing deep stacks in a creative manner. They, in tournaments, you will be able to value bet really thinly in many tournaments. I'm always amazed at how thinly I can value bet in a lot of tournaments. And you, I get dinged on that a lot when I play cash games. This happens to me all the time when I've been playing a bunch of tournaments and then I come back to cash games and I go for a really thin river bet. And it's just the second the chips leave my hands, like, what am I doing? And, and sure enough, uh, I, I'm, I get raised quite often there. And then you're really, you're really stuck there because if the guy is raising as much as he should, you, he puts you in a terrific position, but in a terrific situation for him, I mean, but if, you know that most people don't bluff enough in that situation. It's tough because now you got to be siding towards a fold. So you you get into this war with yourself that is really uh, tough to deal with. Now, cash game players do not think in a binary fashion, like I have to call or fold with my mediocre pairs. This is not how cash game players think. They are more used to playing with deep stacks. If they see you betting small on a coordinated and connected board, they're going to ask themselves some fundamental questions. Wouldn't my opponent have bet larger with their best hands? Wouldn't they want to protect their hand while simultaneously getting value from it? If they correctly put you on a thin value bet with a decent pair, they might just try, they might try to just rip their chips in and see what happens. They know their crappier pairs can't beat the decent pairs you're value betting, but they also know you're more you're unlikely to call large raise with your mediocre pair. Due to this dynamic, you have to be careful with what you thinly value bet in cash games. You need to consider checking back and trapping more in cash games, especially versus more creative and aggressive opponents. All right, guys, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this one. I'll see you for the next one of these. Take care. Good luck to you if you're playing today.